This is what gives us the thermal stability, the chemical stability, and then the introduction of a pyridine group that essentially becomes your proton acceptor, or as I like to say, part of the, oops, part of the sponge that allows you uh, to bind phosphoric acid. So we, we polymerize, we then isolate as a powder, we cast as a membrane, and then that membrane is fused with phosphoric acid. Now the PBI is a little bit different. Uh, in here we actually begin with uh, two, uh, two monomers, aromatic tetramines and aromatic diacids. They are quite soluble in polyphosphoric acid. We call that a reactive solvent uh, because not only does it dissolve high levels of these monomers, but once you heat that up, it actually helps in the condensation reaction by removing water, forming high molecular weight PBI. This is then cast as a very thick uh, viscous solution onto a carrier. It is then hydrolyzed where the polyphosphoric acid changes to phosphoric acid. And an amazing phase transition occurs. So the PBI goes from a uh, really a soft viscous solution to a thick plastic, or not a very really thick plastic, but a very durable plastic. Uh, and that forms the basis of the MBA. So schematically that's shown here. Uh, and again, just to show the phase transition goes from really a sole to a gel process, and this then defines the operating window for MEA's operating window. Well, what's coming up? Uh, there's actually two membranes we have in our, in our product pipeline. One is the TPS-200X and the other high solids PBI. And so the, the 200X is, is very simple. It's actually done by many, but by introducing a dialyl group, we can actually cross-link the base TPS membrane. Cross-linking gives us additional stability without uh, any loss of the phosphoric acid. We actually run these typically at 210C. You can see that over a relatively short time, about 800 hours, we have five microvolts per hour degradation. A typical TPS assembly actually uh, degrades a little bit higher than this, uh, typically at 10 to 15 microvolts per hour, so it's actually a good improvement in that. If we then think about PBI, another a uh, nice development is what we're calling high solids PBI, and this work actually is being done by Brian Benowitz at the University of South Carolina. He was one of the original inventors of the PPA process. But the issue with PBI is that although it's a tough plastic, back, although it's a tough plastic, although it's a tough plastic, there still is slow membrane creep, especially when operating at 160C. So one of the solutions is to increase the solids and get a more tougher membrane. So that's exactly what Brian did. And so this is a stress strain curve for standard PBI versus the high solids PBI. If you're not used to reading these, the tensile strength and the elongation, so sort of pick off two megapascals. You can see that standard PBI would uh, elongate roughly eightfold before it breaks. If you look at the new high solids PBI, in fact, uh, you have to get to basically four times that type of strength before it breaks and goes down. Now, of course, we lose some conductivity because there are higher solids, but not so much that it still is not a viable material. So one of the ways to do accelerated stress testing for these high temperature MEAs is to run them at higher current, roughly 600 milliamps per centimeter squared, uh, and then look at the degradation. And uh, so a standard PPI is shown in green. 600 milliamps per centimeter squared, 180C. And you can see, no way it gets beyond 400 hours, but typically between 2,000 and 300 hours, is 3,000 hours when it starts to go. And if we subject the high solids PBR to that same regime, there's the black line, and now you can see, in fact, very, very stable, 8,000 hours. We look at now operating under more normal conditions, 200 milliamps per centimeter squared, we get 1.4 microvolts per hour, uh, this sample is actually still going strong, but over 12,000 hours operation. So, uh, really a dramatic improvement in the stability for PBI type materials. Next, moving along, if we consider uh, electrodes and catalysts, another part of the Advent Technology portfolio has to do with PGM free catalysts. And I see there'll be some sessions on that coming up, so this is a good tie in. So if you're not familiar with phosphoric acid systems, there's a well-known problem, and that is that the phosphate anion poisons platinum catalysts, especially with regards to oxygen reduction. Uh, it, it's hard to believe, but now it's been over 30 years uh, since they originally developed alloys to overcome and minimize some of this problem. In fact, not much more has gone on since then 
except for the advent of PGM free catalysts. And so uh, this just shows, uh, boy, this shows the, the typical poison phenomena at platinum where you lose 70 to, to 90 millivolts for oxygen reduction. But if now, if you look at a, a commercially available uh, PGM free catalyst, PMF 2010 from, uh, from Perihito powders, you can see that now there's, there's actually no loss as we increase phosphoric acid. So, you know, really something new after 30 years of development of these materials for oxygen reduction with phosphoric acid. Uh, the PGM free catalyst it, for us is Advent. Uh, we first, before we enter and try to develop a product based on these things, we want to make sure there is a good supply and that uh, there's a good scale up capability. And so, uh, Paradito has actually taken preps where they have scaled to 200 grams based on University of New Mexico's sacrificial silica method, where you start with the silica, pyrolyze, uh, produce an iron nitrogen charge transfer series, which they see. So not only forming the PGM-free catalyst, but actually being able to control some of the porosity. But now having checked the box that it, uh, scale up quantities are available, we then started to investigate uh, how these would go into a high temperature in the air. So what I'm showing here is a 45 centimeter squared single, uh, single cell testing. The red line is typically what is achieved uh, with our commercial MEAs. Uh, notice one bar pressure. Uh, the black, which is still substantially below, but actually very encouraging, this is PMF 2010. Um, and so what I can say right now, I mean, it's not ready for a commercial product, but there's still um, some very, very strong characteristics of this. Uh, and so first of all, what I wanted to show was the map of how we actually were able to improve working on this, this catalyst. Some of this work uh, was done in uh, St. Jude Mukherjee's lab at Northeastern. Uh, and before we worked with them, they sort of call his, the university's base GDE using that same commercial prep uh, of the PMF 2010, up 0.2 amps per centimeter squared, they achieved 300 milliamps per centimeter squared. Uh, then Advent started focusing merely on the electrode and the electrode design, and just a little bit on the, on the catalyst. Uh, and so, oven activation, we improved. PTFE optimization, critical in these things, improved. Uh, swapped out the anode from one of the ones that we use, and then focused more on the GDL. Uh, pushed the temperature up a little bit more, uh, and then some of the newer scale-up catalyst preps. And so, the, the point I want to show here is that you can go from roughly 300 to 600 millivolts improvement by a pure focus on the electrode and the electrode architecture. The other part that is intriguing and very, very positive result for these type of materials is stability. And so if you look at a standard commercial MEA, this is now platinum anode, platinum cathode, it's no alloy. Uh, running at 200 C, go three hours at open cell potential, you can see right away there's degradation largely because of the carbon being oxidized but even probably some platinum loss, loss of surface area. If you look at the uh, PGM free, in fact you would be hard pressed to look at the black line that's right underneath the red line here, so this is after the three hours of open cell potential. So inherently very, very stable materials uh, in this very corrosive atmosphere. Okay, so the next topic I'd like to move away from the, the new products and talk a little bit about the role of what I'm calling closed loop CO2 systems. This was sort of hinted on a little bit earlier today with this uh, power to gas, but the key part here is, you know, can we take CO2, considered a disastrous waste product, waste product and convert that to a valuated product, uh, in more particularly a liquid fuel, and then use this fuel for either combustion, internal combustion, or for power generation? making CO2 valuable. The way we see it today, obviously gasoline, diesel, ethanol, fuel up cars. Tomorrow we will have hydrogen, there's no question about that. But what is the bridge? Well, we're proposing fuels like dimethyl ether is the bridge. Dimethyl ether is a little bit like propane, liquefies at 75 psi. Very interestingly, cetane number is 55, diesel is 60. This means that you can take diesel engine and merely modify some of the plastic fittings and tubes so you can run that diesel direct, directly with dimethyl ether. No particulates would come out. DME is not a greenhouse gas. Uh, and, and in fact, there are companies that actually make DME. There's Oberon in San Diego, California. They make turnkey systems, 3,000 to 10,000 gallons a day, even starting with uh, methane and CO2, 
or even methanol as well. In fact, there was a demonstration program in Sweden where they took the waste black liquor from a pulp and paper manufacturing plant, converted that to dimethyl ether, and then ran the Volvo trucks that were running around the plant with that. Uh, so certainly a high potential fuel. So here's one of our visions for wind to wheel, where we start with electrolysis producing hydrogen, we extract CO2, we combine that into DME, and now you have a fuel that's very easy to store, very easy to distribute. Those systems are actually already in place today. You can envision then this DME running an internal combustion engine, but also you can think about it providing auxiliary power to eliminate some of the island. So here you can think of DME as your hydrogen carrier. In fact, better yet, think of CO2 as a hydrogen carrier created from the DME. So we were intrigued by this possibility of turning, uh, using DME directly in the electrochemical cell. And this is now work from Los Alamos National Laboratory. And this is low temperature data and very exciting results in that they took a, a catalyst they had developed, ternary catalyst for oxidating, uh, oxidizing DME, and then compared that to sort of their state-of-the-art direct methanol fuel cell operating at low temperature. And you can see the DME oxidation basically right off the starting gate is as good as one of the best low temperature direct methanol fuel cells. The other interesting part is that with just a little bit of an increase of temperature at 80C going to 90C, you get a large increase in the power. Uh, and so this really became the concept, the genesis of a DOE incubator program that we uh, have uh, with Los Alamos. And that is, if a little bit of temperature is good, would a lot of temperature make it even better? And so uh, what we showed out first is that indeed running with high temperature MEAs and direct dimethyl ether uh, oxidation, that the, uh, if you increase temperature, you do indeed get an increase in your, your power output. But we had learned uh, early in the game that we were really not setting up the right experiment. That in fact, we were limited in this case by the cathode loading. So we really wanted a free running cathode. We increased the precious metal loading to make sure that we were now controlled on the anode side of the cell. Uh, so with that being understood, we then go to very simple experiments by increasing the pressure of DME. Uh, and we're a little bit surprised, right? We go from 3.5 to 20 PSI. We don't really get an increase in performance. And this led uh, some within the group to think, huh, could this be what is called a zero order reaction? That is, it was not the electron transfer rate that limits the reaction, but something occurring after that, like CO fouling or other reaction products occurring. Uh, and so with that as a hypothesis, we then said, well, let's really uh, increase the temperature now running at 240C that would help remove these reaction products and then go through increasing the pressure. Indeed, we now see an increase in output, uh, thus confirming or at least helping to uh, confirm the hypothesis. So uh, with, within the guise of this being a DOE program, we had a, a key benchmark to show, and that's the red X here. This is now anode mass specific activity where we want to show at least a 50% improvement over low temperature direct methanol fuel cell. And this is a, a nice story of, of how we got there. So we started here is now low temperature. These were the, the state of the art uh, Los Alamos results. The green was then increasing cathode loading. Red is increasing the temperature. And now black was uh, going to the highest temperature and now exceeding our goal uh, set by the uh, by Department of Energy uh, and also showing uh, commercial potential. So if you think about where we stand in this ongoing program uh, with regards to the key uh, performance indicators with precious metal loading, uh, you know, still high for a car, but still regards to DMFC, we're sort of approaching our goal. Uh, our first target was actually greatly exceeded 94 amps per gram uh, anode mass specific activity. Our power is encouraging, we still have a ways to go. And although I don't have enough time to lead you through the experiment, but actually the other great part of this system is very, very low DME crossover through the MEA. So 60 milliamps per centimeter squared equivalent compared to a typical direct methanol fuel cell at 60 to 120. Okay, so where are intermediate temperature fuel cells used today? Uh, one actually has been a long-term customer ultra cell. Uh, they're based in California. They uh, pioneered a uh, portable unit 
that uses a, a methanol water mix that then goes directly into the high temperature fuel cell. This is a 55 watt battery charger. You may think 55 watts is, is not that large of a powder, but in fact, uh, for the military, for the electronic soldier today, they uh, typically are carrying roughly 75 pounds of lithium ion batteries for a three day mission. By carrying this uh, range extender of, the, of the, the batteries, you can get that down to 25 to 30 pounds. And in fact, they're actually used by the Israeli military today. Uh, the ultracell is actually going on to uh, look at drones and they're working on uh, leveraging the high temperature technology in drones. Another part is through energy in Denmark. Uh, they uh, again integrate thermally a uh, methanol reformer with a high temperature stack. Uh, what you're seeing here is a, a 30 kilowatt system uh, with a, a tank of methanol. Uh, these are actually being sold within the telecom power areas. Uh, especially areas where the grid is not that stable, not that extensive. Uh, so certainly Africa, Asia, and India. Uh, trucks has been a surprise to us, and I'll talk about that on my last slide, but uh, in China there's actually been a great interest in using reformed methanol going to high temperature stacks to run trucks. And there's some very simple arguments about that. A hydrogen fuel cell station today, roughly one to two million dollars. A methanol filling station today, $60,000. China is the number one producer of ethanol, so they have a distribution system. Um, so, uh, high interest there. Marine, uh, another great application, uh, really more in the developmental stage today, but the idea here is that there are now regulations in the marine, in the marine industry that prevent you from idling ships in port, so they need auxiliary power. The idea is to build a mini grid of 50 to 60 kilowatt uh, before methanol fuel cells all throughout the ship to give you resiliency uh, and still have clean power. And then lastly, uh, just talk about a car that was introduced at the Beijing Auto Show April 2018. Uh, this was actually run off the Serenity stacks, so there's uh, before methanol goes to the high temperature stack. It is a car that can actually go uh, 745 miles without the need of a refill. It can travel top speed 186 miles an hour, uh, zero to 62 in two and a half seconds. All these statistics would be make uh, Elon Musk very envious, especially the fact that you can fill up in five minutes and go that kind of distance. So it really shows uh, that although we'd always thought this technology may not be the best match for automotive or transport applications, uh, the fact that when you pair it with a hybrid, uh, high-powered battery, it actually is perfectly matched to use the liquid fuels that we have today. Well, uh, the things that I showed you today really don't come about unless you have uh, really strong teams, strong collaborators and contributors. And so a lot of the work uh, that I showed you today uh, came out of some not only Advent people, uh, Ryan Pavlicek, uh, Manu Sharma, uh, Dr. Gordipi, George, Chris uh, over in Greece, but also uh, Brian Benowitz of the High Solids. Uh, some of the work I showed with the PGM-3 was with uh, Plamen uh, Artanasov and Alexei Sarov. Uh, Parahito, uh, Sanjay Mukherjee, and then of course our Los Alamos team as well, and the Department of Energy for funding the work. And I think maybe you have 60 seconds for questions, tops.